Good morning. Welcome to our 15th Fusion Friday. My name is Brian Lukunsik. My name is Alex Alvarez. Who's excited about this Fusion Friday? I know I am because we're doing not one, not two, not three, but four axis milling. Yep. <laughs> so before we get started, uh, I want to remind you guys that you always have the option to ask questions in the GoToWebinar chat room. And then we will be able to answer them at the in the end with a dedicated Q and A. Mm -hmm. So yeah, with that said, let's go ahead and pass it on to Alex here, and we'll get the phone rolling. Perfect. Thank you for that, Brian. All right. So before we do get started, just a quick overview on Fusion 360, right? So it is a product that takes you all the way from the design stage of the product to manufacturing, right? If you take a look at that workflow, that could be anywhere from three, four, maybe even five different tools, uh, depending on the company that you're working for, right? But with Fusion 360, you bring that down to one tool, giving your team uh, a much more integrated experience, right? So Fusion 360, um, if you weren't aware, is connected to the cloud. So what that means for you is that you can ultimately leverage the technology, right, or the computing power that comes by being connected to the cloud. Now, connected also means connecting people. So again, being that you are connected to the cloud, means for you and your team that you do have access to your data in one seamless, uh, easy to access environment. So then uh, finally, Fusion 360 is accessible both on Mac and Windows platform. Uh, so you don't need to run boot camp on your Mac, uh, on your MacBooks anymore to access some of this uh, engineering software right, or engineering technology. Also, don't forget to download the Fusion 360 app. You can access all of your data on your phone, and you can show your show anyone a three modeling uh, view of, of your data that once you save it in your, your computer, for instance, mm -hmm. you can access it uh, instantly on your phone. Right, that's so really that's, cool. yeah, and that's going back to being connected to the cloud, right, and having access to your data uh, wherever you go. Yeah. So like Ryan mentioned, today we are going to be talking about fourth axis milling. So um, it's a pretty common topic. Uh, a lot of machine shops have access to maybe some sort of rotary table or, or some sort of uh, fourth axis capabilities, right? So that's why we decided to uh, touch up a little bit on this topic. So some learning objectives for today, um, some uh, common mistakes, right, that we see when people set up their fourth axis parts. Uh, we're also gonna walk you through how to do that, and then finally post out the program to your machine, right? So fourth axis milling, this is again your typical setup that you would see at a shop. Uh, you would have some sort of rotary table, uh, the part is going to be the one that's going to be rotating or spinning on the, uh, the, the table there. And while it's spinning, is that's essentially when you get your fourth axis, right? So if you guys take a look at the diagram, we get essentially what is a rotation about the x-axis, which in turn gives us some sort of a value, right? So now that a value is going to be um, in degrees. So again, you're going to start off with your work coordinate, your initial position. And then you're going to have to rotate some sort of uh, degrees in order to get to your next um, feature for your machine, right? So uh, fourth axis milling can be broken up into substitution or simultaneous uh, fourth axis. So essentially, substitution is uh, indexing, right? So you rotate the part and then stops rotating and you start machining, whereas in simultaneous, you have both um, all, all four axes working uh, simultaneously, right? Uh, now, you don't just have a fourth axis rotating table. You do have something uh, along the lines of this diagram as well. Now, uh, the specific name for it, I'm not too sure, but you do have it. Um, that's where the head of the machine has access or the ability to uh, tilt, right? So it is going to be uh, rotating some sort of degrees about the y axis. Now, this is important because in your post, if you are the one that's doing the post modifications, you do have to uh, essentially write that down in the post or take note that the head is the one that's going to be moving and it's going to be rotating about the y-axis, right? So it's really important to uh, really figure out where the rotation axis is going to take place. All right, so some common errors. Uh, the most common error that I do see is this error message, right? Direction is not supported for machine configuration. Um, essentially, what that means is that you uh, selected a face, right? So let's say you were doing indexing. Um, the word corner system, if you take a look at it, it looks okay, right? The x-axis is running, it looks like it's running directly through the center line of the part, 
But again, if you go ahead and post it, it's going to give you an error. Now, you wouldn't know because you're looking at the top view, so everything looks fine. But as soon as you rotate views, take a look at what happens, right? So the x-axis is tilted some sort of degrees. It's not running through the center of the part anymore, right? And then that's why you get that error saying that it's um, that the direction is not supported. Uh, so this is pretty obvious. You can clearly see that it's not running through the center line of the part. Now, again, it's, it's, there's, there's going to be times when it's not this obvious, right? So what I do recommend, and if you do get that error, is try posting using a fifth axis post, right? If you see, if you see any sort of um, change in the C value, that means that there, uh, the x axis wouldn't be uh, essentially running through the center line of the post, right, of your program, of your part. So that's one way to kind of debug the uh, the error there, and again, it, that's if it's not as obvious as uh, as you see here. So let's go into Fusion then and walk through some of these uh, tool paths. All right, so this part was done in the uh, the modeling environment of Fusion 360. Uh, I added the the uh, rotating table here as well as the the tail slot just for visual preferences. Um, again. You don't have to do this, right? This isn't necessary. But if you sometimes want to verify exactly how close you get to maybe your chuck or the tail stock, um, this can come in handy, right? So uh, again, you do have access to that chuck actually in your uh, cam samples of Fusion 360, right? So if you guys haven't been here, I highly recommend you you take a look through, uh, at some of the work holding that is available to you guys and uh, explore you know, bringing in some of the work holding or, or uh, vices for your models here. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of some of this stuff, make it a little bit easier to program, All right? So again, model this in Fusion 360. You can see the, the design history over here on the bottom. Uh, let's go ahead and just jump directly into the CAM environment of Fusion 360. All right, so here again, Pretty intuitive workflow, right? We're going to be working from left to right in the sense that we're going to create our setup, add some tool paths. Uh, again, if you do have Fusion Ultimate, that's one thing that I didn't mention is that fourth axis and fifth axis milling only happens with Fusion Ultimate, right? So if you don't see the option uh, later down the road, you'll see what I'm talking about. But if you don't have the option to set your tool orientation or to work with wrap tool paths, uh, that's because you have the standard version of Fusion, and um, you don't have capability or fourth and fifth axis capabilities, right? So again, if you want those capabilities, then uh, Fusion Ultimate is is going to be um, the answer for you. Uh, but turning does come standard with with uh, Fusion 360, uh, as well as 2D profiles, right? So you got your water jet, your laser, or your uh, your plasma cutters. You do have the ability to uh, work with 2D profiles in the standard version of Fusion 360. Uh, so once we laid out the tool paths, we're going to want to simulate and right? make sure that we don't have any collisions, make sure that we're cutting uh, properly, and then finally post out your program, right? So again, let's go ahead and get started uh, with the setup. So if you were new to this interface or just new to machining in general, we got what we call these tool tips, right? Which essentially guide you as you're creating uh, some of these programs. Right? So for this, we see that we're going to be setting up our work corner system, uh, as well as defining our slot. Right? So that's what we want to do. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so by default, we do get this uh, square shape for our slot. You can go ahead and change that, right? You can do a fixed size box, a uh, fixed size cylinder. Again, you have a couple options here. Uh, but what I've done is I've modeled the stock that I was going to uh, essentially use. Right? So here I have it modeled. Uh, so in our case, we can choose from solid. And now this comes in really handy, right? If you have some sort of cast, uh, a stock that's from a cast, or um, UI does some sort of operations on your stock, you can just go ahead and model it inside the modeling environment of Fusion 360 and bring it into uh, the CAM environment here. Right? OK, so our work corner system then is telling us that it's going to be on the center of the cylinder here. Uh, we can go ahead and change that to a selected point. And I want the center of the front face here. Right? automatically we see that we get that position there, right? So 
Uh, another thing you could do then is take a look at some of the features that we have here, right? So we have this flat pocket, we have this angled cutout, um, as well as this coil going around the, the part, and then this wrap pocket on the other side, right? So what we can do is, uh, instead of having the, the machine rotate, let's just have this be the top of our z-axis, right? In other words, make the z-axis perpendicular to the top face of that, so that way we don't get any rotation when the, the first operation happens, right? So what we can do then is set this as select z-axis, right? So now it's asking us to select something that's perpendicular to the z-axis. Uh, we can go ahead and hide our stock. Click on this face, right? And now we have the correct recording system there, right? Make sure that you do have the body selected um, or else you are going to be running into some issues. Now, if I would have started with the stock visible, uh, you would have had both bodies selected, right? So you always want to make sure that when you're selecting your stock, either have it uh, turned off or you make sure that you have the correct bodies here selected for the uh, for your setup. <clears throat> All right, so click OK. We get a preview of how it looks. Uh, again, so we have a couple of indexing features as well as simultaneous features in this part, right? So you can, many ways that you can work on, on this part. Um, I'm going to go ahead and split them up between indexing and simultaneous. So I'll get, get all the uh, indexing work done first, and then I'll jump over and do the uh, simultaneous uh, program, right? So for this first feature, again, there's not much to do, right? You just rough out and then do some sort of finishing operation. Uh, so let's start off with a 2D adapt clearing. Selecting your geometry, we want to machine to pocket. Right. We get this blue shading indicating to us what we're going to be machining. And it is going to be machining pretty deep into this material, so you can add some sort of uh, ramping as well as taper to your ramp, right? So that's going to provide for better chip evacuation. Um, and you're not going to have these chips uh, cluster right here as you start machining lower towards this, this part, right? So that looks good. Uh, we can leave some material both on the, the wall of the part and on the floor. <coughs> and we get the appropriate tool path there, right? Okay, now let's go ahead and do some sort of finishing operation. Uh, you can go over here to the top, select the 2D pocket operation, right? Or I could just right click and select derived operation. Again, so essentially what this does is that it's going to select the same tool, same feeds and speeds, same selection, just a different tool path, right? So um, 2D pocket by default, it does have this check for uh, leaving some stock, which it's going to be a finishing operation, right? So we don't want. Um, and then it's going to helix down into the part. The only issue here, though, is that the top height, it's still picking it up as a stock top, right? So we've already removed material here. Uh, what we can do then is just select which face is going to be the top of it, and we can just add, let's say, 100,000 to that offset, right? So now it's just going to be a small helix into the part there, right? Okay, so we have our roughing strategy and our finishing strategy there. All right, so now working through this part, uh, we can go ahead then and take care of this angled cut. So let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> we can use a 3D adaptive. Uh, so again, essentially the difference between a 2D and 3D toolpath is that the 3D toolpath looks at the entire model, right? And it looks at the stock that you have predefined for your model. Um, and then when you select the toolpath, the toolpath is going to get as close to the model as it possibly can, right? Removing as much stock as possible. Uh, whereas a 2D toolpath, it doesn't look at the model, right? You, you have to select some sort of pocket or some sort of chain in order to drive that toolpath. All right, so for 3D toolpath, we're again using our roughing strategy. <clears throat> Selecting our tool, let's go ahead and use a flat right so then this is where the uh, fun stuff 
comes into play, right? So the next tab is going to be the geometry tab. Now we need to select tool orientation, right? So again, tool orientation, if we select this space, what's going to happen, right? We're going to have the z-axis, look at it, perpendicular to it, right? So we have the z-axis. You can kind of tell that the z-axis is already pointing off at an angle here. Uh, but the x and y are, well, would seem perfectly oriented, right? If we go ahead and rotate it, we see that that's not the case, right? Yeah, we get the x-axis going off and, um, into space somewhere over here at a certain degree, right? So again, in order to properly get this toolpath, we need to create some sort of plane that's parallel to the x-y plane, right? So I believe we already have one created here, so we can just go ahead and turn on the visibility. That's the plane that I used to split the part up. And this is a plane that's perfectly perpendicular to it. Right, so now instead of having that face selected, we can go ahead and select the plane that we used. And now for geometry, we're going to be selecting <clears throat> this side here. All right, we get a preview. And now, typically, we have center on boundary, right? So let me go ahead and just select center on boundary uh, just to show you guys some differences. All right, and then, um, again, another big tip that I, that I usually tell customers or, or people that I'm working with is with 3D toolpaths, don't go off and, and select, you know, or, or change multiple options at once. Uh, the reason for that is that 3D toolpaths can be a little bit more complicated. Um, so with that, again, if, if you get an error, you're not going to know exactly which option you change, right? So you have to go back, maybe you have to start all over with the 3D toolpath. Um, so start off small, make a few changes here. So the only change I made in this toolpath is the tool orientation, um, and then I just selected my chain, right? So I'm not going to worry about uh, these other three tabs for now. Now as I'm looking at this model as well, I see that the z-axis is pointing in the wrong direction. Right, so all we have to do is either click on this, uh, on the head of the, the triad there, or just select flip axis, right, and then just click OK. All right, so we get this tool path. Again, we selected tool center on boundary, right? So our boundary was this outside chain, and in return, the tool path then is, is uh, staying within that boundary, right? Or the center of the tool is staying within that boundary. All right, so decent looking toolpath. Um, the only issue is it's helixing into the part, right? So that may or may not be uh, what we want. Again, if you had some sort of work holding over here, that would be the only option uh, in that case. But for us, we have it on the uh, the chuck and on the center point or this tail stock in the back, right? So we can come in from the sides and machine out the material from the outside of the stock. So let's go ahead and change that then. Again, quickly going back into the tool path and then just changing to outside boundary. Right. Clicking OK. And we get a better looking tool path. Right. So again, you can change this, uh, these high retracts by changing the linking parameters to minimum retraction and adding some sort of micro lift, right, of 100 thousandths possibly and, and avoiding some of these high retracts. Okay, so we have this tool path. Again, with this, you're going to have some sort of uh, scallop as you go up the space. Uh, so you're going to have to come back and do some sort of finishing operation, right, whether that be parallel or um, some sort of more spiral or, or uh, some of these other more lengthy tool paths, right? So another option then would be rotating the part a certain amount of degrees and machining this way, right? So that's uh, that would that would be the more the more efficient way to machine this part. Uh, so what we can do then is create a sketch, which I already have created here, right? And then just machine out this material um, vertically, right? So again, it's going to be, a, it might be a little bit lengthier for the roughing operation, but again, you're not going to waste 15, 20 minutes on the, uh, on the finishing operation trying to get a nice finish on this face, right? 
So again, you can go up here, create a 3D toolpath, uh, 3D roughing strategy, or you can just go here, right, create derived operation, or you can even copy the toolpath, paste it. You could have done a duplicate, right? It would have just copied the, the, the toolpath again. Uh, so many, you have a lot of options here to, to play around with when uh, trying to be more efficient with uh, with your programming. All right, so for this, again, all you have to change then is the tool orientation. All right, so now we're, we don't want that work plane. Now what we want, let me turn the origin back on here, is this point here. And deselect that chain and select the chain that we had created or the sketch. Again, we're going to be machining using uh, outside boundary. Everything looks good. Um, now, for this for this case, I did extend the tool a little bit. Uh, what you could have done is uh, selected a short tool, right, and not machining all the way down to the part. Uh, maybe machine halfway a little bit further past halfway of the, the part and then rotated the the part 180 degrees and machine the other side right so that's the neat thing about fourth axis is that you are you have a couple options to play with when it comes to to uh, machining this part here right so um where in other case you would maybe have to set up a fixture or maybe a vice to do some of this machine um, here you can just rotate the part 180 degrees after the first roughing operation, right? So again, for this case, it is going all the way to the bottom. Um, so now what you can do then is just have a contour just coming around here and just finishing up that face. So you can select it to the contour. Again, using that same tool, contour selection. Notice if I hover over this sketch, it highlights the entire sketch. Um, I don't want it to do that, so by holding the Alt key, right, you move on to a single selection, right? So you see that the line isn't uh, exactly following that path that I selected. So again, you have to enable tool orientation, right? So select the X, Y plane here, and see that we get the appropriate looking tool path, right? Okay, and for this, you can just go ahead and click OK. Notice that it is on the other side, so what you can do here then is go back into the geometry tab and then just flip the z-axis. Okay, All right. and we get the appropriate tool pad, right? So now we have to rotate it and finish the other side. So let's go ahead and duplicate that tool path. Control D, we have the same tool path duplicated. Now all we have to do again is flip the z-axis and maybe change the height a little bit. So we want to go lower uh, by, let's say, 100,000, right? We don't want to leave uh, some sort of line there or, or uh, uh, mark there indicating to us that we uh, are just machining half of the part, right? So go down a little bit below it to uh, get rid of that and we see that the tool is going through this, through the part, right? So again, to change that, uh, be careful when selecting your chains. Again, you have to make sure that the arrow is pointing in the uh, correct direction here. Right. So now taking a look at the bottom view of this, you see that it's 100 thousandths below that base there, right? So we can go ahead and simulate what we have so far. Let me go ahead and suppress this tool path here so it doesn't simulate yes and then simulate the tool path that we have okay so here we have our flat pocket We have an angled cutoff face. And then we have our contour operations finishing that off, right? 
Okay, so we're making pretty good work on this part. Um, let's see what else. Okay, so the last portion of the indexing moves would be this drilling operation. Right? So let's go ahead and take care of that. Uh, let me hide some of these sketches. Okay. So now what you can do then is let's take a look at the setup, how our work corner system is set up. Okay, so uh, we don't have a hole that is directly normal to our work corner. So again, you, we're going to have to make sure that we select the tool orientation for this uh, for these hole operations, right? So going into a drilling operation, again, I forgot the size of the hole. You can simply hover over the hole, 0.332, uh, selecting the tool then. Drill Q, click OK. Right. If we were to click on the hole right now, click OK, it's going to fail to generate. Right. So again, it's not normal to our work corner, so it's not going to pick that hole up. What we have to do then, go back into the drill operation and again, enable tool orientation. Right. We have the correct toolpath here. Again, if you were to select same diameter, you would get error messages because these holes aren't in the correct plane as our work corner system. Right? So the way to get about that or to uh, overcome that issue then is by doing a circular pattern. Right? So new pattern is going to be a circular pattern. Our axis, you can pick the center of this hole. And it's going to be four instances. OK. And we see that we get the four holes created there. Right? You can go back to your drilling operation, make changes. Like we want to drill the tip to the bottom of the hole by, let's say, 50 thousandths. And the entire pattern changes as well. right? So uh, we pretty much finished the indexing moves here. So now let's go ahead and jump into some of the more uh, complicated geometry here is the simultaneous motion. Okay, so again, now working with wrap geometry, right? So let's go ahead and start off with a roughing operation. The tool that we're going to be selecting is a quarter inch flat. <clears throat> and now for geometry, right? So typically when working with wrap geometry, I recommend selecting the cylinder first that we're going to wrap about. So again, if you have four uh, Fusion 360 Ultimate, excuse me, you are going to have access to this wrap toolpath, right? So with this, you're able to select the outside cylinder, and now just simply select the geometry that you're going to be machining, right? Again, we get a, a preview of what's going to get machined. Notice for this, I didn't have to select tool orientation, so that be, that's because it was wrap geometry, right? So it automatically knows um, where the toolpath needs to be contained from. Right? So we selected the tool, we selected our geometry, and we selected our cylinder to wrap our sketch or our geometry about. And OK. One thing I did notice, though, is that it's under the pattern um, folder here, right? So you can just simply drag it out, make sure it doesn't pattern that. So that, that around, right? So here we get the roughing strategy for that coil, right? So um, now again, coming back in here and doing a finishing operation on the walls. I left 10,000 uh, 10, uh, on the wall here. So again, creating a derived operation, right? We're trying to do this as, as accurate as possible, but also um, as, as, as quickly as possible, right? Um, Setting this using the quarter inch flat. Uh, the bottom height is going to be the selected contour, but we want to stay above maybe half a thou. Right? We don't want to rub the tool on the floor and um, get some unwanted marks here as it's going around. Again, it's going into the pattern there. You can close that, collapse it. Okay. You can simulate these two toolpaths, right? So you can select individual toolpaths to simulate by simply holding control and selecting the toolpaths that you want. Uh, going up here and simulating them. Let's speed it up a little bit. Again, it's showing the tool doing the rotating um, as opposed to the part, um, right? So 
hopefully in the future we'll see some machine simulation where we'll actually see the part be the one rotating, right? That, that'd be nice to see. Um, so here we see that we get a finishing operation on the walls there, right? Again, it looks like we have some like graphics card error there. So you can see some bleeding field part of it. Right? So now, we're, now that we're done with this section, let's go ahead and work on this wrap pocket. Right? So this is going to be the wrap pocket. Um, again, you can just simply do a drive operation from this one. Let me bring it below the contour. And then just edit the geometry. Right? We're going to be machining, not that chain. So this chain in here. We're going to be leaving 10 thousandths on the wall. And then just simply click OK. All right, we wrapped around the same cylinder. And then we just created our tool pack here. Right? So again, duplicate this contour. Right? It's a lot of repetitive work here. Uh, then deselecting the chain. And selecting the chain that we want to. So moral of the story is control D, use what you've already mm -hmm. got. Yeah, use the tool pass that you already got and, and um, some of the options that you already selected. Uh, something even easier would probably be to do templates, right? So now templates work a little bit better on turning, where you have a profile that you want to machine, um, maybe some holes that you're going to be drilling or blowing out as well as spacing operations, right? So with milling, it does get a little bit more tedious, but if you already have working recipes, like let's say, you know, your linking parameters or maybe some of the heights controlled for some of these tool pads, you can just go ahead and create some sort of uh, template for this, right? So now when you're working on a part, um, simply select the chains that you want to machine and then delete some of the tool pads that you're not going to be using and make much better use of, of your time that way, right? So that's, that's another option to use. Um, control duplicate is a pretty pretty big one for me. Um, so, okay, so for here, looks like we already have that tool pack there. All right, so then finally, it uh, looks like we would have to go ahead and work on this uh, text here, right? So again, for that, um, engrave would be a good one. Right. The only thing is, though, that you don't have that wrap toolpath capability in engraved. Right. So unfortunately, um, it's only going to be vertical to the, the to the, the machine or to the tool. Um, it's not going to wrap this text around the cylinder. Right. So then the other option then would be to use a 2D contour. Right. So again, selecting your tool. You can use this three eighths inch, right? And then selecting your geometry. <coughs> now, with two D contour and text, I found it somewhat counterintuitive selecting some of this geometry, right? So again, selecting the cylinder that I'm going to wrap about, and then the geometry. Right? Notice how it begins selecting some of this um, individually, right? So you can go ahead and select this, and it only selects that edge there, right? So what you can do then is just click on that edge again. Notice that it's open contour. Go ahead and change that to a closed contour. And hover over some of these edges until you get that entire closed loop, right? Click OK and doing that again one more time. And then just selecting until it closes, right? So I'm going to do a few of these just to uh, get the point across here. So. Selecting the edge, it's going to be a closed contour, right? And then just adding that. Make sure that you do accept that current uh, contour selection. Otherwise, it's just going to be that that single line or the these two edges that you selected. Right? All right. So last one here. Change that to closed contour. Do that. Okay. So bottom height is a selected contour. Um, you can either change that, or it's a little bit easier to stock to leave, right? So this is where we're actually going to use stock to leave to machine a little bit deeper. So we can go anywhere from two to five thousandths with this uh, tool, right, to do the, the, uh, the engraving. Click OK. 
equipment and we get the tool that's there, right? You can't really see it because again, it's 5,000 below that. Um, you can go ahead and change some of the lead ins and lead outs that we have for this. It's not falling directly on the lettering there, right? <clears throat> Okay, so it looks like we're almost done. Last step then would be to create this chamfer. Uh, so again, let's go ahead and do a 2D contour. Right? Using that same 38 45 degree chamfer mill. Geometry, let's go ahead and select this um, edge here. And wrap tool pad, right? <clears throat> what happens? We get an error. So this is this is a Kind of a bug if you, if you uh, tell me, right? So it, it's a little bit um, cumbersome to come back in here and really get this this uh, tool path to work. So there are a couple options to go around it. Um, one would be to use tangential extension, right? So you can use um, 2D contour, right? If you had maybe some sort of a, a small arc here, uh, then it would be able to use uh, tangential extension, and then just extend it, uh, the diameter or the radius of this uh, edge here, right? So uh, that's that's one option there. Uh, another option would be to create geometry that isn't fully closed. Uh, so that's the only reason why wrap geometry didn't work was because it's a closed circle here, so it wasn't able to wrap the geometry and then um, work properly, right? So let's see if I have that sketch created. Uh, yeah, so I do have it. So what we can do then is go to 2D contour. Geometry is going to be this edge right here. Make sure you wrap the tool path. All right, so we got a preview here. Okay, click OK. And there we get the correct tool pad, right? So again, let's go ahead and simulate some of these tool pads. Uh, what I like to do also is turn off the body, right? So we get a better visual representation. Um, you can change the material as well, right? So the color of this ceramic, I find that this is a little bit better to really visualize and change that to gray. Right? So simulating some of the stuff, again, let's get that. Okay, skipping that one. <clears throat> All right. So you pretty much yeah. done like almost all the tooling mm -hmm. on this part. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So here we see the chamfer. What you can do here is again use tangential extension and extend that um, tool path a little bit further, right? So it looks like we got some there. Yeah, so yeah, it looks like it plunges into here. So what you can do then is just make sure that you go back into T and have the correct. Yeah, okay, so looks like I selected the wrong geometry there. Uh, let me change this back. And going back, editing. Well, you don't have to deselect everything here. Oh, the, that's the issue here. Okay, so simply click on this, delete the current um, chain, select another chain, all right? Edit, maybe close contour. So now we get the appropriate loop here, right? So there we go. Um, another important topic that I wanted to touch on, right? So with flat pockets, the tool path that we selected is going to, to work fine, right? But with rat geometry, um, if you guys uh, were to machine this right and exactly how it is, it's not going to clean up this edge here perfectly, right, or this wall right here perfectly. So um, what I mean is that you are going to see some sort of gouging 
on this wall. And that's because this wall is directly pointing to the center of the cylinder, right? So to get a better visual representation of what I'm talking about, right? So this is how wrap geometry would work. Um, think of this as our tool. Right? So if you were the one modeling this part, uh, you have to keep in mind of the tool that you're going to be using. And for the wrap geometry, make sure that you create uh, that perfect offset to this tool, right? So essentially try to model this this radius here, or try to match this angle of the tool. Um, again, so with wrap geometry, you typically have the edges pointing towards the center of the part, right? You have the center of the, the tool pointing directly to the center of the part as well, because that's the, the definition of a fourth axis mill, right? So when you select your, your contours, obviously you're gonna have some sort of gouging here, right? So if you select, again, it's important to which uh, edge you select. If you select the top edge, um, you're gonna get more gouging. If you select the bottom edge, uh, the tool tries to compensate and machine somewhere in between, right? So you're still going to get some sort of uh, this little slither of material um, here left on the top, and then some sort of uh, material here removed on the bottom, right? So again, uh, if you don't have access to five, five axis machines. Um, the best you can do really is, is do some sort of 3D tool path and try to scallop down. Uh, otherwise, if you try to do this, you are gonna see some, some sort of gouging into the part, right? All right, well, let me go back here and post out the code. Right, so last step then, posting out. Uh, you do have a couple options here, right? So the, the most common one that I've seen a lot of people use are Haas A-axis. But again, depending on what machine you're running, what controller your machine is using, uh, you are going to have to use that specific post, right? So um, if you don't have access to that post or that A-axis post, uh, try to go into the Autodesk HSM post library. Proceed to it, right? And then just try to see if the post is somewhere inside this library, right? So um, again, if it's not, feel free to reach out to us and that's something that, that we can help you out with. Um, we do modifications for posts as well. So again, if you don't see your post in there or you want some small changes, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, and also just, just for those of you who don't know, uh, HSM is built into uh, the CAM as the backbone here in Fusion 360. So it's essentially almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right, so posting out the code, we see here that we have the program, right? So the first pocket, again, like I mentioned, it was directly perpendicular to our work hornet, right? So we didn't have to rotate. Um, let's see if I can show a couple more, please. So then the next adaptive, right, we get some sort of rotation in the A axis uh, and so on and so forth, right? So I also enabled uh, G187, right? So that's a built-in user property uh, inside of Fusion 360. So if you guys do use G187 for your uh, Haas machines, um, feel free to give that a try as well. Right? All right, so that's pretty much all I had for today. Uh, just a quick overview of what we did, right? Setting up your fourth axis part uh, to run on your fourth axis machine. So we also went over some of the common mistakes uh, that people make when really programming or setting up their parts. Right? You, you want to make sure that you do have a correct setup uh, when when uh, doing these these tool paths, right? And then finally, we posted the code out and uh, made sure that the A axis was working properly. All right, so here at Katib, like Brian mentioned, we do do consulting, right? So one of the things we offer here at, at Katib is uh, Fusion Boost. So essentially what Fusion Boost is, um, it's a service that's attached to the seat of Fusion 360, right? So with, with Boost, you do get uh, an introductory call, right? It's typically an hour long. We go over the, uh, the user interface of Fusion 360, kind of walk you through how to set up some of your projects, some of your user preferences. Um, we also have fundamental training once a month. So that's a four hour training that you can use um, for yourself, right, to get up to speed on Fusion 360. Uh, we also have access to four one hour sessions with either Brian or myself. And 
that can really be covering anything you want, right? So whether how to set up your your C or your part, uh, maybe some of the, the best options or the best techniques to model the part that you're currently going to do. Um, again, whatever you, you want to talk about in that one hour, you do have uh, access to, to both Brian and I, right? So we also check up with you once a month or, or twice a month, depending on how often we, we communicate. Um, but we want to make sure that you're using the tool, right? And that you're using it uh, to its full potential. So again, if you go onto Autodesk, you will see that the price for Fusion is $300. Uh, but here at Katib, we sell it for $4.99, but that's with Boost attached, right? So um, again, with Boost, you get all the services that I just mentioned. Uh, and then if you need Fusion Ultimate, uh, that's going to be $17.99, but again, it also has Boost attached to it as well, right? So Yeah, and if you already have Fusion and you want to get Boost, you mm -hmm. don't have to get another seat of Fusion. You can just get uh, Boost itself. The Boost portion of the right. service itself, yep. correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask them. Uh, if not, you guys can always reach out to us, whether it's Fusion 360 or really any Autodesk manufacturing software, right? We're here to help. We want to make sure that you guys are successful in, in using this tool. So whatever question or, or issue you're having with the software, um, feel yeah. free for you to email us. Yeah, it looks like we have uh, two questions of, or two pe different people asking the same question here it is pretty much, uh, how are you able to access the four and five axis in Fusion? Does it come along, come in the standard version of Fusion? Yeah, so so it doesn't. Um, unfortunately, four, fourth and fifth axis capabilities only come available in uh, Fusion Ultimate. Uh, right, so just the, the differences between Fusion Ultimate and Fusion Standard are some more advanced simulation, right? So if you're looking for advanced simulation where you actually want to see your product, or you actually want to see how these two objects or three objects are interacting with each other, um, that would be event simulation, right? So that for that you would need Fusion Ultimate, um, and and again you would need uh, Fusion Ultimate if you want to do fourth and fifth axis uh, machine. Yeah, and if you guys missed any of this uh, video and you want to uh, want to pretty much watch it, uh, go ahead and check us out on YouTube, Kati Fusion Fridays, and we'll be posting this video. Uh, once we're done editing it here. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Yeah, if you guys don't have any other questions, thank you guys for watching.